everyone. How's your day so far? Excellent. Amazing. Is it feeling sciencey? Yes. Good. Uh, we're right into it, guys. It's the first day of National Science Week and you're so lucky that you get to kick it off with us at our Talking Science panels. We've got three incredible scientists uh, to learn from and hear some amazing stories from right here on Gadigal land today. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that this land has been cared, get cared for by the Gadigal for thousands and thousands of years. First Nations peoples are the first scientists, first storytellers, first astronomers, first bread bakers, the list goes on and on. Um, and we'd like to thank the Gadigal for allowing us to continue to learn on this land and to care for country here. Um, and I'd like to extend that acknowledgement and respect to the First Nations uh, custodians of the different lands that you've traveled from across Sydney today. And of course, to any First Nations students, learners, teachers joining us in the room as well. Well, today's panel is an amazing one because it's all about scientific expeditions like from coral reefs to the hills of Papua New Guinea to remote central Australia, these three scientists have some incredible jobs and we're so excited for you to hear all about their careers, how they got there and maybe how you could follow a similar career. I'd highly recommend you get the mental notepad ready because like, if you want a career in science, following in the footsteps of these scientists is a pretty exciting thing to look at doing. Sydney Science Trail, before we go on, I'd just like to acknowledge is a partnership between the Botanic Gardens of Sydney and the Australian Museum. And you guys get to float between all these amazing workshops and panels and expos today. It's also supported by the Australian Government, the University of Technology in Sydney and the University of New England. Now, now without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, these three scientists. The first scientist on my left is Dr. Emma Camp. Emma is a marine biologist and the team leader of the Future Reefs team within the Climate Change Cluster at the University of Technology in Sydney. Emma is an internationally renowned corals expert with her research focus on the physiolo physiology, ecology, and my favorite new word, biogeochemistry of coral reefs. Emma will be talking about her expeditions to reefs, reefs around the world, including reefs in the Seychelles. And like, spoiler alert, it involves crocodiles and sharks. It's so cool. Uh, to the left of Emma, oh, please give Emma a big round of applause and welcome. Great. To the left of Emma is Peter Jobson. Peter is or has collected plant specimens from the four extreme points of the continent. He has spent time working in the sand dunes of the Simpson Desert, the rainforests of North Queensland and the Alpine Peaks. These collections form the basis for research in describing new species, understanding the variation of plants and to study the geographic patterns of species across Australia. He currently manages the Botanical Information Service for the National Herbarium of New South Wales. Please give Peter a big warm welcome. And to Peter's left is Dr. Judith Field. Judith is an archaeologist who works at the Australian Museum as the First Nations Archaeology Collections Officer and also holds an appointment as an Honorary Associate Professor at the University of New South Wales. Judith will be sharing insights into ex her expeditions and research on the Papua New Guinea Highlands mid-Holocene settlement. Please give a big warm welcome to Judith as well. Right, guys, well, this is how it's going to work. You're going to hear a presentation from each scientist. And then at the end, we're going to pass over to you. And if you have any questions at all about something you've heard um, or maybe how to pursue a similar career in science, you can ask away. And there may or may not, but mostly may, be a free hat for people who ask. I know, I saw you get excited. For people who ask questions. All right, I'm going to pass it over to you, Emma. 
Um, so before I begin, um, I also want to extend um, my deepest respects to the traditional custodians um, on the First Nations people from the countries that I've been able to work. Um, and there's many, uh, there's over 70 clans here on the Great Barrier Reef, but also the other countries that I'm privileged to work. So I want to acknowledge them and the amazing team that I work with. I have a group of 30 people here um, at UTS, but also collaborators around the world that um, is just a snapshot of some of the science that's going on. So. Well, I'm going to talk to you today about something called super corals. So these are corals that are more tough than the average coral. And I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey around some of the countries that I've looked at and try and explore where these corals are. But what is a super coral and why am I interested in them? Well, we're going to start by going to the Seychelles and I'm going to talk to you a bit about um, a site that I had studied there. So. This is kind of an example of a coral reef. It's only a snapshot. You can only really see one species there. But the point is that it's colorful, it's bright, and that's what we want from a coral reef. And this was a site that I'd been studying for um, yeah, just under a decade. But unfortunately, during 2016, I was there during a mass coral bleaching event. Coral's an animal, it has a microscopic algae that lives inside of it. They're kind of like the uh, solar panels, if you like, for the animal factory. So. You need them, it provides the energy. But when the conditions become um, too hot or some other stress, the algae leaves the coral and the coral turns white. We say the coral is bleached. Now in 2016 and 2017, it was the first major back-to-back -back marine heat waves that were experienced here in Australia, but also um, globally. Here in Australia, 30% of the Great Barrier Reef was lost. Um, and this was something that occurred globally. So this was in 2015, 2016, 2017, the pictures that you see there, the same reef. And you can see that large areas of the coral basically had been lost. Now, as a scientist working on coral, um, this is, you know, this is the worst case, right? We don't want to see that loss. And so for me, it's like, right, what, what can we do? And, and what's the future going to be for corals? So myself and colleagues said, OK, let's look to nature. Where are the corals that exist that are naturally resilient to these stresses? And to do that, we were like, well, we need to explore somewhere different, right? We see the reefs getting impacted. But actually, there's areas of the reef that are naturally hot, naturally acidic, naturally have low oxygen conditions. These are the stresses that are happening under climate change. So let's find the corals that are already surviving under those conditions, study them, have a look at their genetics, have a look at their physiology, learn from them and see if we can then find a network of them sort of as a refuge. But also, can we learn about them to try and help the rest of the corals? So we found um, some of the most kind of extreme corals documented in some mangrove lagoons in the Seychelles. This is us studying them there. And there was a variety of corals that were surviving. So you've got this kind of level of diversity of coral when a lot of the reef, sometimes only a few hundred meters away, had bleached and died. Now, the question is how, right? That's my whole kind of research group. We're trying to understand what it is about these corals that make them special. Um, but also, what's the cost of living um, in those hostile conditions? So we know that every superhero normally has some sort of weakness, and it's no different for these corals. We know sometimes they grow slower, they um, actually have less diversity, and they're all things that we need to understand to help us better manage the reef into the future. So we'd found that these corals existed in the Seychelles. We now wanted to say, well, where else do they um, exist? And we found that actually the more we looked, the more we found. So across the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific, we continued to find these super corals. So the next site we wanted to then look at was New Caledonia. So the reason we were interested in this site was that we basically took to Google Maps and we were saying, where are these lagoons that are adjacent to coral reefs? So that top left hand picture, you can see kind of the inlet going in surrounded by mangroves. And we basically were just looking on maps, trying to find these areas where we thought these resilient corals may be, and then reaching out to local communities, collaborators to go and explore them. Now, the picture on the right, what's exciting, it may not look that exciting to all of you, but for me, was very exciting because that's the first validation that there was actually coral in these lagoons. Those yellow kind of blobs that you see under there are, are all coral. Um, and when we put our face under the water, we can actually see that there's this real diversity in there. And so we put sensors in to try and understand what the conditions are and take very small coral samples to understand what's special about them, what's different about their physiology and their genetics. 
Now, a fun thing about doing expeditions, particularly when you're basically just looking at a map and saying we're going to go there, um, is that you don't have a lab, right? So I have a very nice lab at UTS. It's great. It's not what happens when you go on an expedition. So that far back shipping container was home for two weeks. So I basically just had like a throw out mattress on the ground and um, taped up with duct tapes and nets across the front to stop mosquitoes. We made a lab on a, on a dining room table. And I think that's a common thing you'll hear today across the panel is that you go to these um, remote places for expedition, but you have to make it home um, whilst you're there. So I guess the last expedition I'm going to touch on brings us here to Australia. So I was really lucky um, to get some support from National Geographic to have a look and see if there were extreme corals like the ones that we've seen in the Seychelles and in New Caledon Caledonia here in Australia. So similar thing, we got out our map, we got out Google Earth, we kind of charted a course and off we went. Um, and that's some of the most exciting things for me as a kind of coral scientist is that a lot of the reefs um, we know quite a lot about, but amazingly, these kind of inland reefs, not many people go there, um, and there's reasons for that. There's lots of crocodiles, sharks, jellyfish, all of the things that we generally try to avoid when we uh, are a coral scientist, unfortunately, are found in these mangrove lagoons. But there are also these really resilient corals, and for me, that's something that I'm really interested in. I'll try to um, obviously avoid all of the hazardous marine life, but um, we can see that actually we'll go there then when we find these sites, we'll collect water samples and um, we'll snorkel around and try and find like what diversity of corals are there. So we'll take pictures, do video transects. So we can start to have a long-term kind of monitoring of this. Um, and yeah, always have one eye in the back of your head, especially when you're back to the mangroves. And I was saying in the talk before, for me, crocodiles are, are my big fear. Um, I'm okay with sharks and, and jellyfish, but yeah, crocodiles definitely give me that that tingly fear, so that's my, my big fear. But when you find corals, and that's what it's all about. And so one of the things that we've been doing is actually transplanting corals. So we take corals from the mangroves and put them on the reef, and we take corals from the reef and put them on the mangroves, and we study them for one to two years and try to see how their genetics and their physiology change. And the reason we want to do that is that actually growing these corals and um, facilitating some of the reef recovery, if we're going to use these kind of super corals, we need to understand if they keep their tolerance or not. And these sorts of experiments are one way that we can get that information. We'll then bring back um, small samples, so about the size of your um, sort of little fingernail. We'll take very small coral fragments, bring them back on the boat, freeze them in liquid nitrogen, and then we bring them back to the lab. So bring them back to the lab and we can look at the genetics, we can look at kind of the chemicals that they produce, and that all gives us an insight into how they're surviving. Why? What's the purpose of all of this? Well, one for new knowledge, but also what can we do to help the reef? With the losses that we're experiencing, we now know that we need to intervene, we need to help the reef. So one way has been to kind of grow corals up and actually work with um, traditional owners and the tourism industry to replant corals, um, but also to understand if we got to a point where we lost a lot of the reef and we needed to look at things like genetic modification, that we can use these super corals as a blueprint, if you like, for that, um, for that process. And so we'll take those corals, we'll plant them back on the reef after they've been in these nurseries and we'll continue to study them. So before I hand over to Peter, I think I just want to end on this. I think we hear a lot about the fact that the, you know, the reef and environment um, is, is really struggling um, and sometimes it can feel overwhelming what we can do as an individual. Um, and this is a quote by a marine biologist and uh, amazing lady. Um, she's one of the sort of um, pioneering marine biologists gone down to some of the deepest parts in the ocean. And she has this quote and it says, many of us ask what can I as one person do? But history shows us that everything good or bad Bad starts because somebody does or doesn't do something. So I challenge you all in here today to find um, something you're really passionate about um, and put it to um, some really important use because we definitely need your generation to be part of the solutions. So thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Your work is so hopeful and beautiful. And I also love that you're like, sharks, fine. Jellyfish, fine. Crocodiles, can't do it. No thanks. Thanks so much, Peter. Go for it. Hello, everyone. I would like to acknowledge um, through my working life, having um, been on the country of the Aranda and Pitjantjara people in Central Australia, and also the Umatilla um, Indians of uh, Oregon, North America. All right, how do you become a field botanist? Well, these are some of the things you need to be able to do. 
if you you need to have a fascination for wildlife, um, for um, particularly plants, um, but also just natural history, you need to have an eye for detail. You want to be able to observe differences and similarities. That's how you're going to be able to note different species, ones that are already described and those that haven't been. Um, but sense of adventure, because often you get to go into really remote areas where you dropped off in a helicopter, and then eight hours later, you have to be at exactly the same spot with your GPS reading because then they're going to pick you up, except that time when they don't. And um, there'd been some sort of event and we had to wait for a helicopter to come from a neighbouring station and pick us up and bring us back to the campsite. There was no road. There was no electricity. The nearest um, road was over 80 k's away. But where we were staying was 120 k's away. It's all very exciting for the day. Um, but love of a mixed work environment. So the three of us are incredibly lucky. We're not trapped in an office all day long. Half of our life is spent out bush somewhere. And that's really, really fun because while you, and you get the best of both worlds, you get to go out in the bush and go and see stuff and then you come back and you work in the building and the, I really like that sort of diversity in the job. It means then that it's not a very straight boring thing. There is always something different to keep you occupied. And finally, you have to be prepared to deal with the hot, the cold, the dirt, the dust um, and being bitten by insects. The longest time I've been without a shower was seven days. We were in an area where there was no water. We had two tanks in the car between the towns we were going to be in and the water, even washing up, was down to a cup. Everything else was to keep us so we didn't um, dehydrate because it was hot. So you had to deal with not bathing, and we survived. Okay, what sort of thing is job opportunities? So like you, I went to government schools. I went to three, um, and I wasn't that brilliant. I only got an average grade. Um, and then from there on, I managed to get into university. I, I chose one that had a very strong biology unit, um, and so worked my way through there. What sort of job is when you came out? Because this is really important. Well, the most common, and if you want to be a botanist, is um, environmental consultancies. They are desperate for botanists. There is always work to keep you busy. Um, less so, and is to be either a lecturer or at a university or TAFE. Those can be a little bit harder to get hold of, but um, they're definitely there. And my two colleagues here have um, been able to score that sort of thing. Um, and then you can work like me in a state or federal agency. So I work at a plant museum or herbarium. Um, this is these gardens is who I'm employed by, but I'm based down at Mount Annan, down near Campbelltown. Um, you can work for national parks. Um, in, they'll have science positions in there as well as being a ranger. And even being an arranger, you can do a little bit of research and keep your hand in. Or there is a government agency where you are involved with things like threatened species or government policy and all that sort of thing. And there are jobs in there too. So I want you to give away that this is not a dead end thing, that there is no work at the other end. All right, this is the amount of collections I've made since May 1985. Um, and you can see that I've pretty much traversed big chunks of the country. You will notice that spots there I've driven on roads. Those where there are concentrations, particularly in arid Western Australia and the Northern Territory, is where I've been on expeditions, um, usually with a group of a government agency called Bush Blitz. And they will um, set up a camp for two weeks and we will work there, being often helicoptered out or driving out on the limited roads that we have available. And we will smash looking at all the organisms. So there's not just botanists, there's people that will deal with insects and small invertebrates and mammals as well. Okay, this is me collecting. So basically what we're doing is we will collect a plant specimen. That thing that I've got there is from, um, is a brand new pea species. Um, it occurs in the Limonbite National Park on the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, there I am, you can see on the right, I'm pressing the specimen and using a day press. You'll also notice I have secateurs and I have a collecting book. So those samples then will be pressed 2D and then they will be um, kept in the, in the herbarium and I'll send them to other herbaria around the countryside. 
Um, so here's the, one of the opportunities. You get to have plants named after you. So this funny little bush tomato here in the lemon bite, it's only known over a 6K radius um, in this very bland-looking environment. There on the right is a close-up of the flower and the weird-looking leaves. And the group of scientists I work with in America have um, decided to name this after me, which was very nice and quite an honour. Um, so this is the sort of thing you get to name plants um, after all sorts of things. Okay, here's another one with the same group of Americans that I deal with. So this was taken in the Judbra um, Gregory National Park um, in, in, in northern part of Northern Territory between Catherine and going to the uh, border of WA. Now here we found this new bush tomato. If you have a look underneath the flowers, particularly the group on the left there, you will see that a whole series of spines. We call this name Solanum scalarum. Now scalarum in Latin means ladder. And we did it twofold. Yes, you can see those spines that look like a ladder, but we also had to climb up all those steps to get to the top. We actually found this and a brand new wattle just by the side of a track, which takes you to a lookout that anyone can use. And we were one of the first lot of people that actually decided to see what was up there, and we were able to find um, these two new plants. So discoveries happen everywhere. Here is another thing that we also do. Um, there's my colleague there, and he's getting well, that pond scum will turn into seven different types of freshwater algae. This was collected up in the Kosciuszko Mountains earlier this year. And on the right-hand side there, we also monitor rare species. So this particular species there, we were looking at the see, we, we were monitoring these to see if they're shrinking or growing in population size, and also to try to find new populations. This one wasn't a new population, but in this particular trip that we did, we were looking at an egg and bacon pea that grows in the swamps, known from only three localities, and we found a fourth, which was very exciting. As we've, we've said, the accommodation is very salubrious. You know, um, here we are um, waiting for a storm. And you'll see those things that are sitting on top of the truck. Um, you will notice that they, that's the plant presses. So what we do is you saw me collecting those. They go between sheets of newspaper and then sheets of um, cardboard. And then they're kept in um, pressed like this for weeks, a week or so until they're dried. Uh, this is the same method that Banks and Salander used when they were with Captain Cook. It's the same method that Robert Brown used when he was on the Flinders expedition of 1802 to 1805. We use very simple technology still, but we also do interesting things with molecular work now. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing that we have old and the new, which I really love. And as you can see there, <coughs> you get to always have a room with a view. It just may not be that fancy, like a fancy resort. We never go along the main road. It's always the road least travelled. So this one here there on the left was taken in central Queensland, going into one of the tablelands. Actually, it was on holidays, but I wanted to do a plant collecting trip. And on the right, this was again on that Kosciuszko trip, and it decided to snow on us. So you go, still go out there and you see those things. Uh, the only f unfun thing is when you get the secateurs stick to your hand because it's very cold. Um, rain, snow, stinking hot. Yes, it's all the conditions that you do when you go out there. Dust storms, you just sit in the car until they blow over. Um, here's a photo taken in February this year. This our team here was flown to the top of the Mount the Pilot, which is an area just near Kosciuszko. If you look behind those mountains there, one of those is Mount Kosciuszko. We were there in February this year. We were the first um, Western scientists to actually um, be on the summit, and the three, the four people there. Katie there, um, next door to me, and the fellow in the middle in the pale shirt, they were looking at collecting live vouchers to put in the botanic gardens. So they were collecting seeds and live plants to bring back to, to grow. Uh, my colleague in the black and myself, we were there to enumerate all the species we could get and take a sample so that we would have a representative that would last for hundreds and thousands of years so we could always get a snapshot in time of what was happening in February 2023. This is the sort of thing we do all the time. Um, so I would like to acknowledge this group of people because they've allowed me to um, 
go around the countryside. So, of course, where I work now, the uh, National Herbarium here with their plant um, gardens down at Mount Annan. Uh, I was worked for 10 years in Alice Springs, so I was in the Flora and Fauna Division, and they allowed me to do all sorts of interesting things. Uh, Bush Blitz Australia, they have sponsored and allowed me to go to various really wild and woolly spots and dropped us there and usually did with helicopters. And also Bucknell University, who are the people I've been doing the tomato research, but also looking at the diversity of the sandstones between Kakadu and the Kimberley. We are looking at what are called sister species, closely related ones. We're looking at their DNA, and we're also comparing them to other species that occur right across that length. We're looking at the differences and the similarities between their um, DNA and their morphology to find out how they got where they got. And some of the preliminary studies is really, really fun. So finally, what I'd like to point out there is the half and half of gender balance. I think it's really, really important to show that um, this is not a male sport. We have always had women in botany. In fact, for the last 80 years, we have had women in very senior positions, and I'm very honoured to say in our plant society, the most highest um, honour you can be given is the Nancy Burbage Medal, and it is very sought after as a, anything in our society and is given to the best of the best each year. So I'd like to say that... Um, the sky is the limit. I came from a government school like you. You don't know where the hell you can go, so I'd love you to give it a try. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. I find that map of your collection sites incredible. There is not a single part of the country you haven't covered. <laughs> Judith, come on up. I'm an archaeologist. Um, I dig holes in the ground. And a lot of people don't think we're scientists, but everything we do is based in science, whether we're dealing with plants, animals, soils, um, environment. Um, and I'll talk about it in a minute. And what I'm going to do is talk about some work I've done in New Guinea. I've worked right across the Australian continent, but very few people are really aware of New Guinea, and Papua New Guinea in particular is where we work, as that island north of the country. <laughs> uh, we were asking questions about when people were settling in the highlands. We know when the first um, colonists came through, they're likely to have come through New Guinea before they came down into the main Australian, uh, uh, what we now call Australia. And one of the things... Oh, but firstly, here we go again. How did I get here? And I said, I don't necessarily recommend this journey, but this is how my life unfolded. I didn't finish school I, uh, because of family issues. I had a chronically ill mum. And I became a laboratory technician, which I did for 10 years in a research lab at Sydney University. So at 27, I applied and became a mature age student. I did my degree part-time over six years and worked four jobs. And then I did an honours degree at the University of New South Wales and a PhD, so 10 years. That's how I am, how I came to be here. Okay, so why do we work in New Guinea? It's pretty much overlooked by most researchers because it's pretty much in the too hard basket. It's really challenging to work there. But it's, New Guinea is a really integral part of Australia's evolutionary history. And you can see the upper map shows what it looked like about 20,000 years ago when we had the peak of the Ice Age, all the water was caught up in the ice caps, and all the le sea levels lowered. And so Australia and New Guinea were one and have been for the last 100,000 years. So it's only 9,000 years ago when the climates improved and the sea levels, <coughs> sea levels rose after the melting of the ice caps. And that's what that lower picture is. It's just at the point where Australia and New Guinea became separated. So, so where are we working? This again is a picture of New Guinea and you can see the Sahul Shelf and that's underwater now because that's the Torres Strait. We worked in the highlands because it's one of those places we know little about. We know there's one or two sites that show when people arrive, but we don't know little about how people got there. And the place we chose was Simbai, Simbai and Kairon River Valleys in Madang Province. And that you can see there is the runway, which is a you fly in one way and you fly out the same <laughs> direction. And they use short takeoff landing aeroplanes to get in there and it's actually on top of a swamp so there are times when you can't get in 
Now, how do we find sites? Well, we walk and we walk and we walk. We spent nearly seven months in the um, Simbai Kairant Valleys. And here's one picture of in the river, looking at what's exposed when the river is high. And you can see sort of three levels there, different colours. The top one is light, dark, a light and a dark. And at about three metres below the ground, we've got a, a radiocarbon date of 800, nearly 800 years. And what that means is that those two really wide horizons above it um, accumulated very quickly and we think it's associated with land clearing as people started um, doing more farming. We also walked to the highest parts and this is a cave, Canberra Camp, up on the top of the range and here we dug a really deep hole and the bottom date was only about 1600 years. And this is again because of the, the weather, the high rainfall, you get this massive accumulation of um, sediments and we think that cave was a hunting camp where people stopped. And this little place we call Lick Lick Machu Picchu. <laughs> Lick Lick in pigeon is little because it was such a prominent feature and it sort of reminded us of it. Now that's my colleague Ben. He walked out on top of that thing because none of the locals would because it was too steep. And you can see the blackness on the side. People are always lighting fires and burning the landscape, clearing land to put in gardens. They're subsistence farmers. We also looked at places like this. This is a uh, salt spring. And in the past, people used to collect the water, which is laden with salt, dry it out, package it up and use it for exchange. An exchange for food, exchange for goods like axes um, and other, and other um, commodities. But as we walked around the highlands, we found lots and lots of things lying on the surface and we put them all together here as a picture. So the ones on the far right are axes and they have a really polished edges on them. They would have been mounted in wooden handles. Uh, the ones in the middle of bowls, sometimes some of them used as mortar and pestles to grind up food and medicine. The ones on the left are at club heads. So these would have been also mounted on wood and wood for hitting things and people, I presume. <laughs> and the one on the top left is actually a pestle and that has had a carved face on it. One of the villagers brought it in for us to look at. So they're all on the surface and they're found all over New Guinea and nobody really knows how old they are. So, so we did some digging and you can see I, the locals we worked with in every village, we trained them up and in the first one we're being serenaded by a panpipe. <laughs> the second one, one of the buddy, the dog, fell asleep in the pit while we were digging. And the third one we had a chicken. But you can see at the top of that right one the artefacts sort of sitting on pedestals and that's because once we've dug it out we then have to map them in so we know the relationship of one thing to another. And then one of a uh, pit we dug up on the saddle between the two valleys, um, that's a two by two metre pit, that took weeks to excavate. But you can see the ages there, 14,031, and 31 is about the oldest date we've got from that region. We don't really know how people came up into the mountains, but this we thought was one of the pathways. Now that's a contour map and you can see there's lots and lots of contours and when they're close together it means it's really, really steep. <laughs> and across the seven months we recorded lots and lots of sites, all those dots are sites that we found. And the one I just want to show you, SIM 18 down the bottom, was a really exciting one because we made some discoveries there that were really groundbreaking. And that, I didn't mean that to be a pun. <laughs> so this place is called Wyam and it's up on the 1800 metres on top of a range um, we had to go over a 3,000 metre range, took me five and a half hours to walk there. And uh, this is where we made some really exciting discoveries because we think this is on a pathway from the coast up to Mount Hagen in the highlands where you may not know but the first agriculture in this area, in the whole of this region has been found. And that's the house we stayed in, that's the hut, it's made out of bush materials and that overlooked the the valley below us where you can see a river on the far right, that's the Jimmy River and then about 50 kilometres further on is Mount Hagen. And underneath the houses we found all of these um, artefacts and these are things that people have dug up while they're digging their new gardens. They keep finding bowls or axe heads or pestles and that's what made us think this could be a really rich place to look. So we dug some holes and this is right on the top and you can see four arrows there pointing to four different holes. And in each one of those, we made some really exciting discoveries. And there are three of those things I'm going to show you right now. 
So modern pestles, um, again, known all through New Guinea, no one knew how old they were. We actually found two broken pestles in the ground and were able to find charcoal associated with them and dated to between four and 5,000 years. Uh, this is the first time they've really been found and dated and we're finally getting an idea of how people use that landscape and what they were using it for. It looks a bit like the one in the bottom left. You can see down the bottom the shape of it. But across New Guinea, all of these things are highly, um, highly decorated. And in fact, I think it's the one on the, the right, the one with the sort of the bird head, was actually stolen out of the museum a few years ago and they've never found it, never been recovered. The other thing we found was this part of what's called a carved face. This is like about as big as, you know, like a tennis ball or a softball. And that was really exciting too because we've never actually identified how old these things are. And this shows us again, this is between four and 5,000 years old. And again, it was dated by radiocarbon dating. And the last one is this red ochre stone. I don't know whether you've heard of billens. These are the bags that people make in New Guinea. You see them in the museum, people walk around with them. And the patterns of them that they make are usually connected to a tribe, tribal group or an area. But this one is ochre. Now, ochre is often used for making rock art paintings. It's, it's used for, you know, mixing with fat and other things to decorate bodies when they're doing ceremonies. And this one uh, was used for colouring string to make the billings. And these are all 3D... Um, we made 3D scans of these things. We were able to look at them under the microscope and identify what they were used for. And again, these are in the same place where the... Uh, the bit pestles and the far face were found. And not only that, we also found material that showed that they were making axes up there as well. And that's me. Oh, I was going to say, I didn't do this alone, of course. <laughs> there was quite a few people involved in the work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith. Big round of applause. <laughs> All right, guys. Well... I'm going to pass it over to you now. Uh, before we do, can we just give all three of our amazing scientists a like, big, big round of applause? Now, does anyone have a question? I knew you guys are want, you want the hat, don't you? <laughs> okay, why don't you go first? And just to repeat it for our friends joining on a live stream. The question was, Peter, what's your favourite place you've travelled? I don't really have a favourite plant. <clears throat> I have favourite communities. So I love looking at um, grasslands um, up in the s snowy mountains and out west. I also love heathlands, like along the coast and in the mountains and also inland. And I really love Mallee communities. Although the spiky spin effects is not that much fun to get through and you do end up having to pull the mount later in your leg and things with a bit of pus, but, um, yeah, but it's fun to go wandering around in there. If I was to go for any group I, of plants, I w have always worked on the egg and bacon peas and do have a small soft spot for those, obviously. Excellent. Was it place or plants? Plants. Both. Both. Great. Is there one place that stands out, Peter, as like, you know, real highlight? <sighs> The Southwest WA, um, there's a place called Fitzgerald River National Park. It takes up 0.2% of the entire West Australian landmass, but has over 20% of its entire plants. So it's a phenomenal place. If you ever watch the earlier series of Star Trek, all the plants when they go to those weird um, planets are all plants from WA that they're able to have in pots uh, on, on, the, on the set. So, yeah, it's an amazing spot. You will see the weirdest things in your life down there. So definitely worth a trip down there in spring and early summer. Are you going to put it on your travel bucket list? Yeah, great. It's gone to number one. I love that. Uh, okay, thank you. Over here. <gasps> Anyone? 
Emma, what's your favourite place you've dived at? Yeah, Big so question. That is a tough one. Um, so actually the far north of the Great Barrier Reef has been one of the favourite places. Um, offshore, so it's quite hard to get to. It takes, um, from Cairns, it takes three to four days on a boat trip to get up there. Not many people like the ribbon reefs and things like that. Um, and it, get, it gets really exposed to like high wave currents. So all of the corals are really like funky formations and just, yeah, and you still see a lot of big things. Um, orcas sometimes come round at the edge. I haven't seen one, but yeah, all like all of this like big marine life. So yeah, that's been a, a highlight for me. Incredible. What an amazing office to go to for work. That's so cool. Okay, maybe um, right up the back there. You're going to have to yell it out. <gasps> Emma, have you ever seen a crocodile? Uh, yes, I have. Um, but luckily not um, just snorkeling along and seeing one right there. So... Um, when we go in the water, we'll put a drone up first of all to try and see if there are any around. And um, we also have an underwater ROV, which we'll have. Um, and the idea, right, is to not be in at the same time as them. So we'll we'll get out um, if we see them, or we won't get in in the first place. Um, to be honest, one of the most um, scary things has actually been um, some of the shallow mangroves where we don't often see crocodiles because of where it is. And um, we were walking along and we heard one um, and they kind of bark, right? Mm. I didn't know this until I heard it and then I was like, and then I got on the boat very quick. But yeah, it's like a barking noise. Yeah, yeah. and like we've just uncovered one of my special talents, um, baby crocodile. If I hear that, I'll be running yeah, back to the it boat. It sounds so cute. <laughs> Come on and see it. They are pretty cute until they get I've here. also encountered crocodiles um, in the mangroves of North Queensland. And, yeah, yeah, I've heard that noise and we ran like hell out of there. Um, and I've actually had a car fail on me crossing the East Alligator River a few years ago. I've forgotten that there was tidal. I went across the river crossing and then, of course, the car um, decided to die because we got water in the engine. I eventually got the engine going, but that's when I discovered one of the persons in the car couldn't swim and the other one had panic attacks and I got us all out and I got one of my friends, he went onto the front and jumped out and went to get help and I just fiddled with that damn car because the electrics went, didn't it? So we couldn't get the windows open nice and hot in that car. But yes, and the crocodiles, because this was the East Alligator River, are just watching us as we're sitting there. Um, so yes, it was very exciting. So yes, also part of the job. Wow, science can take you to some crazy places. <laughs> okay, we probably have time for one or maybe two more questions. Yes, right at the back there. Yeah, go for it. What's the most interesting artefact you've dug up, Judith? Well, interesting in Sorry, interesting in scientific terms. Um, I spent 20 years excavating a, an old lake bed out in western New South Wales, near Brewarrina, digging up megafauna, you know, the diprotodons. And we found the jaw of a diprotodon and the leg bone of one of the extinct giant birds and a stone tool wedged between them. And that's the only evidence we have from Australia that shows that megafauna and humans are actually contemporary. The only place. So we found blood residues on that as well. So I, I, says, I guess that's the most spectacular one we found. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is incredible. <laughs> that is so cool. Okay, one last question. Go for it. Favourite artefact or species? Me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Look, I'm really into grinding stones in a big way, and I know that sounds pretty sad, but grinding stones are really a key to understanding how people lived, what plants or animals they used. When they grind things up, they grind up cats, lizards, uh, grass seeds, all sorts of things. And at the same site where we found that... Um, artefact between the bones. We also found the, some of the oldest grinding stones in Australia. And now we've found them even older at a place called Majibibi up in the Northern Territory. And we've been able to identify from the residues on that stone that they were grinding up water lily. Water lily about 60,000 years ago. I and mean, that's quite an extraordinary find. It's not published yet, so you've got it here first. <laughs> 
Wow, you heard it first, guys. <laughs> Incredible. All right, folks, you need to head out and do whatever it is you're going to do next, which I'm so sure is going to be so great. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to let you know that the fun doesn't stop here. You can watch this recording on um, our web website, sydneysciencetrail.net. Dot au. Great. You can go home and go, check this out. That was an awesome day. I asked this question. You can relive the fun. Um, but before we go, can you just please give another huge round of applause to our scientists? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. What was that? Oh, yes. That's such great. And I was just going to say, too, um, I hope if there's anything that you've really felt from the presenters, the scientists today is how much love there is for what they do. Doing a job where you get to go every day and do something you love and also that is so good for the planet is an incredible privilege. And if you love science, it's not so much about whether you're good at science. If you love it, that's the best place to start because it can take you to some incredible places. So we did this for the last group. We'll do it here too. Hands up if there's anyone who's like, oh, that was pretty awesome. Oh, I might consider science. There we go. Excellent. Me too. So good. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Um, enjoy the rest of National Science Week. Thank you.